Hi, I'm Eric, and this is Adventures in Golf. And for this episode, we traveled to a Californian island whose town was built for the tourists. But the golf course, that remains for the locals. If I told you that the oldest course west of the Mississippi sat in an idyllic island valley off the coast of Los Angeles, you would go, right? If I told you that this tiny island with just 6,000 residents was visited by over 1 million tourists each year, would that change anything? After living in Los Angeles for more than 13 years, this is my first trip to Catalina Island and its nine-hole golf course. Why am I going now? Because I have a reason. I have a story. It's a 70 minute ferry ride from Long Beach to Catalina that costs around 50 bucks. Looking back, maybe this is one of the reasons why I never went. It's unusual to do touristy things in your hometown. Like, do New Yorkers go to Times Square? Nah, they just pass through. Is it touristy? I mean, it must be. Avalon is. This is David. He works on the boat and grew up on the island. We got to talking when he noticed my clubs. The all too familiar fight club nod of someone who knows. I would have to imagine, like, growing up there, you would have a relationship with a tourist that may not be overall rosy, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Like, what is that like? Uh, you know, they come and go. So, you know, you don't spend very long with them. And then see you later. So that's for you what changes it, is, is getting to know someone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a lot of people that will visit Catalina all the time, and you get to know them, and you get to know them as more than just somebody spending money to pay your bills. And that's when things really start to become beautiful there. That's interesting, yeah, because it's a very transactional relationship. Somewhere in the middle of the ride, the temperature drops, and all of a sudden we're inside of a cloud. Like some sort of Catalina Triangle, the coastal California marine layer became disorienting. It's as though the boat and its passengers passed through some type of portal because as quickly as they arrived, the clouds disappear and a beautiful island is revealed. Wow, it looks like a 3D model, like come to life. How is this California? It feels like Spain. Doesn't this feel like Spain or Europe or something? Yeah, I gotta yeah. guess, right? Monte Carlo. Yeah, it doesn't feel like America or, or yeah, at all. Monte Carlo. Yeah. Monte Carlo. Yeah. Like at first glance, it looks so idyllic, you know? It just is almost like, how could you ever leave here? This is very welcoming and inviting. Very shortly after getting off the boat, I see exactly what's happening here. This is a tourist trap at its deepest core. It definitely feels a bit too perfect, which is great for a visitor. And I suppose it's great if you live here. You know, in LA, they have these like Hollywood back lots where the set is built and it looks like a street. And this kind of feels like that a little bit. Kind of like a facade. Like, are there people in these buildings? Are they actually selling items or are those fake? I did notice there's a place over here called Eric's on the Pier. And if my nose can be trusted, I think that's funnel cake I'm smelling. There's something about going to get funnel cake as a 40-year-old man at a restaurant on a pier of an island that seems fake by yourself that just kind of has its own little ring to it. Can I do just uh, the powdered sugar, please? Thanks. If you look at this beach, it's like the smallest, cutest beach I've ever seen. It's perfect. It's all perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. It's like clearly unreal. It's clearly fake. I feel like I'm in the Matrix, you know, when the guy's like, I know this steak isn't real. But the funnel cake tastes really good. Mm -hmm. 
while we were on the boat right over, our, <laughs> our producer offered some gum, and I said, that wasn't Wrigley's gum by any chance. Mm -hmm. She was like, yeah, it is. Wrigley yes, Spearmint. it and is. So this island wouldn't be here if it weren't for this name. Well, the idea of it being like a tourist destination was started before Wrigley purchased the island yeah. by other entities. So really what you see and enjoy today is really was Mr. Wrigley's vision, yeah. for sure. It's kind of making me think of someone else. You must know I'm big enough. <laughs> no. Disney. Mm-hmm. Do you think Walt Disney ever came here? We're not sure. I feel like he must have. But we're trying to make the connection to find out, did he, was he, was Walt here and got inspired by what he saw here to make Disneyland? That's what we're trying to do at the museum is try to figure that out. I feel like he must have. Must have. And so here we are at the birthplace of Disneyland. The only problem is I'm a bit suspicious of happy places, much less the happiest of places. Life is difficult, for real life anyway. And just beyond the edge of reality, I see a crack in the wall, a token of real life that reveals itself out of the fog, a large container ship about to make port in Long Beach. And all I can think of at this moment is the Truman Show and that scene where Jim Carrey realizes that there's something beyond the wall, that the world he is living in is a manufactured one. For Truman, there was something beyond the wall, a real life filled with surprises and lifelong friends that don't want anything from you. And on Catalina, there is something beyond the tourist strip, the golf course. Make sure you pick your own balls. Don't grab somebody else's. Yeah. Right. I'm right there. Double J. Thank you. Double J. Double J. Double This mighty and stunning nine-hole course sits outside the tourist map for some reason. Its primary customer, the Latino locals who moved here and made this island happen over the past 100 years. Cab drivers, waiters, bartenders, construction workers, busboys, hotel staff, cooks, janitors, and barbers. Their neighborhood park has nine flags on it, and after a day's work, they show up here in jeans and work boots to take part in the greatest game ever played. This is the Mexican Open. Back in the maybe 93, 94, that's when everything started here. It's just a little small group and then it came bigger and bigger every time. Now we have like 30 to 40 every Wednesday and every Friday. And everybody's welcome here. We got new guys every time. Come on, baby. Come on. Nice job, Annie. You get to meet new people all the time. And we play scramble, so it's best ball. So you're going to see right now that, you know, they're really bad golfers and really good golfers in here. I've never seen this many different types of golf carts oh, on a hole. We've got uh, kind of a work truck, a uh, Yamaha. I mean, this is truly bring your own cart, huh? Yeah, everybody brings their own cart and you don't have to rent it from here. Right. Yeah. I was born in Mexico and I came over here and been raised here all my life. Well, how old were you when you came over here? Four. Four? Yeah, so and I was born and raised and graduated okay. here. And how old are you now? Uh, 20. Okay, and you just got into golf? I want to say a couple of months. You've only been playing golf a couple months? Yeah. So who got you into golf uh, right now? His son. Okay. His son, he, son. He, yeah, he's my best friend, and his his cousin is also my best friend. They they big golf, they they're really good. So they like brought me out here, and I used to always suck and I hated it. So I wanted to get better so I can at least play with them. And see, like everybody scrambles to a different hole because okay. they want to make it before it gets dark. Oh right, okay. That's what that's the reason everybody goes to. A How long will it take to play nine holes here tonight? Around two hours. Two hours. Two hours. Okay. Cool. Here we go. The round is underway. There's always that feeling after the first tee shot where it's just like, it kind of feels like you put a casserole in the oven and now all you got to do is wait. Do you play golf? Well, miniature golf more than regular golf because I'm working two jobs almost all the time. I'm a bartender at the Avalon Grill 
So I bartend night and I drive in the daytime and have no time to play golf. Man, we I gotta clear up some of your schedule there. <laughs> what brought you to the island when you came here? Well, my father used to come here since the early 50s and two older brothers came along, I came along, and then two younger brothers came along. So we got five brothers, four of us drive taxis and fell in love with it because this is a place where you can work hard, make a lot of money and save most of it because there's no place to spend your money. Except the places you work at, <laughs> <Yeah>. the bar. <laughs> so has Catalina changed much since your father was visiting here and since when you moved here in the 70s? I would say a little bit, not a lot. They built quite a few complex of condos and uh, maybe a dozen homes, but not much, because housing is the biggest problem really? that we have here. Why, there's not a lot of it? or it's... No, they don't build anything. 88% uh, of the land belongs to the Conservancy, and the Conservancy protects that land. So what you see, the city of Avalon is what it, what it is. They haven't developed anything in 20 years. The they that Javier is referring to is the Catalina Island Company which more or less owns and operates everything on the island. Now, I'm not the most by the book producer, so I got into a little bit of a snafu on this trip. It's probably if you're sending the policy, I'm assuming it's in the policy. Essentially, it's the same function of having a certificate of insurance. We wanted to shoot at different locations around the island, but we needed a special permit that was only attainable with special insurance, which I have. So that's why we always okay. ask for the physical copy. But what they needed and the cost boggled the mind of even my own production insurance broker, and we were stalled from filming. It's okay, it was raining anyway, which seemed kind of fitting in the movie narrative of this episode. Looking for solutions, I spoke with a local about how I could get around the island. His response, call my friend Danny. And for a tank of gas, he'll take you anywhere you want to go. So here I am, meeting Danny, a chief mate on a cargo ship who has two things that not every local has here on the island, a full-size vehicle and a pass to travel the interior. Born and raised here, he's no tour guide. And trust me, his opinions are his own. For example, his thoughts on the famous bison that inhabit the mountains here, the leftovers from a movie shoot some decades ago. I'm excited, man. Yeah? How many bison are there? I think they're down to like 60 or 70. Yeah, it's just a tourist attraction thing now. Really? Yeah, I think it's they- It's literally just a tourist attraction. Yeah. <clears throat> that makes me not want to go see the bison. What know. else can we do that's not a tourist attraction? What else can yeah. you show me that on your island? I'd say coastline. Coastline's that. my favorite. Yeah. So growing up on the island, I bet coming up here used to be a lot different than it is now, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of changes. Uh, this whole complex is new from when I was a kid. This is the kind of low-income housing that they put together in the last 20 years. Pretty nice low-income housing. <clears throat> yeah. This is the Wrigley's house right here. Looks pretty nice. Yeah, it's really nice. I mean, from what I understand, good people. You don't seem convinced. There is a lot of uh, politics on the island, but I mean, like, people I'm not... disagree with the way they go about their business. But you know, like what, for, for example? The, um, they closed down the theater. That was a big bone of contention with the community. At the casino building, they had a, a movie theater in the lower level, and they they closed that down because it wasn't profitable. And a lot of the community thought they should keep it running anyway. The new regime is a little more like catering to. You know, they'd be much happier if NBA basketball stars and baseball stars were coming over and, you know, spending that level of money. So this is the summit. That's where we hit some golf balls right here. This is, this is definitely the summit. Yo, it's like walking out on an airplane wing, kind of. Yeah. We could be anywhere right now. We could be in any country, and you would just be blown away by this scenic situation. Yeah. Do you feel more at home on the water sometimes? Do you feel that way? Yeah. What's that like? Like home? You know, it's nice. You get into a routine, you know? Yeah. yeah. What's the routine like? Well, I'm the 
chief mate on board. So if it's a if it's not a day working chief mate position, then I, I have the watch um, four to eight in the morning and four to eight in the evening. So th those are my my working hours to basically drive the ship. Have you heard the origin of the of shit? The word shit? Yeah, still high in transit. I think one way sailing to the new world, they would bring certain cargoes and then they needed ballast and something of small value would be manure. So they'd, they'd load the boat with manure and go back to England. And, you know, guys in the old days would go down there with the, the lamp that's lit, you know, it's an open flame and the manure would give off an explosive gas and then blow the ship up or catch fire. So shit was so high in transit so it gets more ventilation and the ship doesn't blow up. That is so crazy. Yeah. And now it's a curse word. Yeah, yeah, you know where posh comes from? No. So port outbound starboard home would give you the best cabin. So when the liners would come to the US, if you are on the port side, you get like the warming sun in the morning and the afternoon shade. Having never met someone who drove a container ship or anyone who's ever worked on a container ship, it was great to talk with him about more than just the island. It turns out his son is an avid golfer and they play together at the nine hole course whenever they can. He wears his watch that belonged to his father on his right wrist, not because he's a lefty, but because that's the wrist that his father wore it on. Since Danny is an Islander not employed by the Wrigley's, these are the things that I never would have known if I had stayed on the designated path. You must be the uh, legendary I'm Lolo. Lolo. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm not legendary, I'm just an old man, that's all. At 97, Lolo Saldana has been cutting hair on the island for 66 years. And he, along with the countless photos, trinkets, and souvenirs around the shop, is a living history to the island that he's always called home. Now here's a guy here, you, probably, you might recognize those guys, I don't know. But these were directors and producers and so on and so forth. And Johnny Weissmiller, that's the original Tarzan. Okay. And you gotta know this guy, Mickey Rooney. Sure, right. Yeah, he's George Davidson that brought him over and he was a... Uh, Who brought over Tiger Woods. Right. Oh, there he, he is. Was, they were filming him, he's right there, he's just five year old. And here's Bill Russell, the big basketball player. This is Ernie Banks. Ah, oh, okay. Ernie Banks, right. right Morty Wills, of course, you know. Right. Yeah, and then, well, we had a lot of good guys that used to come over here, and they were all really good. So, can I ask you about the Mexican Open? <laughs> it's a good group of guys, and they play, and they have their fun, they drink their beer. I mean, that's what, that's what golf is all about, really. Yeah. Before Wrigley, the island was owned by the Banning Brothers. And in 1892, they built a three-hole golf course with oiled greens as an amenity. The mini course was a huge hit, so in 1894, it was expanded to nine holes, where it stayed until 1928. William Wrigley and D.M. Renton decided to build an 18-hole golf course here. Wrigley wanted the tourists to be able to have all the top-of-the-line modern activities of the day golfing being one of them. When Wrigley came to Catalina Island, my father, along with other Latin workers, found out that there was gonna be a lot of infrastructure work on Catalina Island. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? They need strong backs. <laughs> but Wrigley was such a good man that he built houses for these guys to stay in so they could stay and work. This is the kind of heart that guy had also. You know, consider your worker. I kind of grew up there, right, right back here. So every time the course was closed, like a 5-6, you know, come down. Was there, there even a fence back then? There was, but I mean, there's, there's a couple doors. And if not, the kids will make uh, holes in the fence. <laughs> Golf courses shouldn't have fences. Yeah. In 1931, the course was tournament ready. So Wrigley created the Bobby Jones Trophy Championship in honor of his first ever Grand Slam. So there's Bobby Jones playing here. Can't mistake that man's swing. Bobby Jones exhibition, 1931. And here we have a local legend. Yes, Lolo Saldana in 1951 when he won the Bobby Jones tournament. Wow. 
I went to college and I became a pretty good golfer. I played against Venturi and Roger Dunn, some of those guys. Wow. I got a picture of Venturi there. And I played and I and I played well. So I came over in fifty one from school, from college, and I and I invited Venturi to come to that tournament, but he said, I can't make it, Lolo. Later I said, I wanna thank you for not coming over. He said, Why? Because I won the tournament that that year. <laughs> This uh, black and white one here. What's this? Oh, that no, that's a golf course. Yeah. That's the original 18 holes. What at, at the time? That's the older 18. That's the upper half of the 18. And World War II came around and they made it down to nine holes. When we went to war, the island of Catalina was used by the War Department. And so the 18-hole golf course was kind of neglected at the time. You know, the military's running it. Uh, they're doing, a, I think, a shooting range was out there on the first hole of the golf course. So they were using the golf course for several different things. And I believe that's when they decided, let's just go back to a nine-hole golf course. Joe, right? Yeah. Nice to meet you. My name's Eric. Pleasure. Hi. Pleasure. Um, so, uh, <laughs> We spent some time yesterday with your brother. Oh yeah, Lolo. <clears throat> yeah, he's uh, he's got a good memory for a guy at 90. What was the first year you played golf on this golf course? I was about nine, and then like 11, 12, they used to have the Bobby Jones big tournament, the Lolo one. And we would always caddy at the time, you know, carry the bag and maybe make $2. And Lolo was very good. I never took lessons, none of us did. But we just grew up by catting oh, yeah. and watching the guys what they maybe they were behind a tree or something and you'd say he'd say, Give me a six iron or something. And we just learned that way, you know, and just the way they swang and everything like that, that's how we learned. The culture of the place doesn't really exist on the main drag. Yeah, yeah. But it seems like the golf course, in an awesome and surprising way, really does. Yeah, it unites us in a lot of different ways, you know, because, you know, we do tournaments for to help out people also. You know, we, you know, we're there for the community when it comes to, like, trying to, somebody needs help and stuff. So we come together at the golf course, you know, we all love playing golf, you know. We're not good at it, but. We have fun with it. <laughs> I mean, that's the definition of community, right? Yeah, exactly. Way back, there was hardly any Hispanics here. And my mom came from Mexico, from Michoacan, and which Lola probably told you this. And my dad, as a laborer all his life, was, happened to stay. He married my mother in 21. She had 11 kids. So if she'd have known that, she, she probably would have gone back to Mexico. <laughs> there was only like <clears throat> maybe eight or nine families on the island at the time. And now it's a whole different ballgame. Now that's <clears throat> a lot of families, Hispanic. I'm glad that my dad said, look it, when you're in this house, you speak Spanish. So when I speak it, they said, wow. <laughs> This type of golf is not the common golf. It's not at all. This kind of golf right here is just a totally community experience. I mean, most of these guys, sometimes they show up and they don't even have clubs. They just borrow someone else's clubs. And I don't think anybody ever anticipated this extra side to it, that it became a wonderful community event, bringing people together. Um, whether, they, whether they're good at golf or bad at golf, you know, golf was not a game for the, the masses, but it is here. So you're 81. How often can you get around the course in 81 strokes? Oh man, I used to I used to be under par all the time. <laughs> and then as you get older, I'm lucky to be on the golf course. <laughs> period. That's the way I look at it. It's nice to be here. Yeah. You know, and to be with these young guys. And I mean, I've been there. Everybody gets a turn in golf, and it's just a just a great game. You know. We'll have a golf game Saturday morning, and they hear about it about 11 o'clock, and somebody will be brave enough to come up and say, hey, here's yeah. the game. It's pretty rare, though. Yeah, but yeah, very it happens, rare. But, it's but rare. when they do, immediately they're like, yeah, come on, you're in. It's 50, you might lose 20, 25 bucks. <laughs> but you're in. And, but you'll get more than that in money. But, and, 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 uh, yeah, people are really receptive when they do that. Yeah. But uh, 
but yeah, it takes a, when you just if you're just here for two days and you don't if you're not brave enough, you won't find yeah. out. But you guys were pretty brave, so you guys did a good job. Yeah, I think you found out what it's about, you know, which is good. It's good for us. Good for you guys too, I think. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Thank good. you. I hope you had a good time. I had a great time, but before I left the island, I had two things to do. First, not one to turn down any invitation, I stopped off at the Avalon Grill to see Javier. I wanted to say thank you for his hospitality. And it turns out he had a gift for me, a CD of himself singing mariachi songs. I thanked him and told him how perfect this would be for the second thing on my list. And you know what? I think they do go well together. Cansé de rogarle, me cansé de decirle que yo sin ella de pena muero. Ya no quiso escucharme, si sus labios se abrieron fue para decirme ya no te quiero yo sentí que mi vida se perdía en un abismo profundo y negro como mi suerte quise hallar el olvido al estilo Jalisco mariachis y aquel tequila me hicieron llorar 